Okay, so uh, let's jump on here. Hopefully, oh, hopefully we can see some more faces here. The personal touch. Um, I wanted to jump on and do the combine training uh, topic. One reason is I know a lot of people who are, are doing that type of uh, preparation, and and you know I have conversations about it. I'll, I'll be at the the NFL Combine and I'll have like an all you can eat breakfast with Tommy at the Marriott and, and yeah. Rob and. Um, uh, the other part of it is I get asked a lot of the time to do combine prep and a lot of time is not worth my while just because of their one-offs here and there. And everybody wants to make the CFL where you're lucky if you make 50 grand. So it's, it, you know, it's very tough from a monetization point of view. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was, okay, what is important as, as part of that process um, in terms of the training, you know, what tests do you, you really focus on, and I'm sure it varies by individual. And then what about the business side of it? Like if you want to actually do this as part of your business, what is the best way to do it in terms of pricing, marketing, getting people through the door, getting results, and then, you know, again, using those results to kind of promote your business. And maybe some of those people stay with you if they're a pro athlete after that. So I think all of that stuff is pretty interesting. It's kind of this catalyst and maybe uh, 20 years ago, this wasn't possible, just like this conversation. But but now it is to maybe build a business around combine prep. So um, we'll kind of we'll we'll kind of quit everybody here. I think everybody has something to offer. I have Rob on because he's a great conversation starter. He's a good looking guy, and uh, we're going to talk a bit about some of the other aspects of of sort of the combine process. And Rob and I, you know we spent some time during one of the medical evaluations. I want him to comment on that and, and the importance of that. So first uh, let's, uh, let's start with Tommy. Tommy, how did you, I, I know you do combine prep. How did that come about in terms of your business and, 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 and then sort of how did it grow from there? Can you, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. Uh, well, I kind of, I fell into it. it. It wasn't intentional. I was at Northwestern uh, as the assistant strength coach in 2000. And uh, I got thrust into the role of being in charge of the speed development programming for the, for the football team. And, and, uh, and so I was, was in that role with Northwestern's team. And after the season, guys that were looking to prepare for pro timing day uh, or go to the combine uh, asked if I would train them for it. And I said, sure, <laughs> you know, and uh and I was still on, you know, on salary, you know, very small salary, but I was on salary at Northwestern and, and in that role. And, and so I, you know, just took a crack at it and was already doing work towards speed development and figured we could figure out the other drills. And, and uh, so I started like that, um, you know, and then through the um, you know process of having guys to train, had some good results and outcomes and, um, and built some relationships with some agents that wound up kind of perpetuating forward after I left Northwestern. And, uh, just, it's kind of been every year since then, um, uh, you know, just not a, not a snowball to anything monstrous, but, uh, you know, pretty steady every year to have somewhere between, you know, three or four guys up to maybe 10 guys that, uh, I've had a chance to train. So you feel like you have, at this point you have a a formula or an approach that you're happy with and you know you kind of follow that every year with the group that you have in in terms of uh recruiting or in terms of training just the training we'll talk training first and we'll get into <laughs> business stuff later uh, i i'm never i'm never satisfied with what we're doing um you know and i i always you know in, in every year i'm always looking at what have I learned in the past year or, or you know, how can we um, do a better job in terms of what we're doing from a, a programming standpoint? And so it's definitely over. I think this is my 20th year. It's, it's definitely evolved a lot over the years um, in terms of what I'm actually doing. And I, 
I, I always, I feel like mm -hmm. with, with this training in particular, it's so um, important in terms of the numbers that guys get um, that I, I just, I feel like I owe it to them and to myself to just always um, see what we can do better every year. So it's, uh, I, I don't reinvent the wheel. I try to be intentional about, you know, knowing some predictability and results over past years and like never change too much, uh, but really look at, you know, what are things that, you know, that I've learned or that my team has learned in the past year that we can use to make us better in that, you know, that six to eight week training block that we have. When you go to the actual, say, combine event, is it stressful? Uh, it's for me, it's, uh, and my wife would tell you, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it feels very high pressure of everything. You know, it's a, it's not a huge part of our business. Um, I mean, it's, it's profitable. It's, it's significant, but it's overall, it's not huge. And, but it produces a lot of stress just because there's so much riding on the line. And, and I, I feel, I take it very personal with the players that we train and, you know, I, I want to give my very best and, and you can never, you can never guarantee an outcome for a player, even though um, I, I have confidence in, in our system and by and large, we've had really great results, but not everybody. And, and it's never a hundred percent. And um, so when it comes down to like a player actually performing on the day, like I'm, I'm always, um, you know, I'm very nervous. <laughs> I try not to show it, uh, but I'm nervous when they run and uh, I want them to do really, really well. And, and uh, so it's just, you know, there's always that unknown of how the, that, you know, 22 year old mind is actually going to process the feelings on that day. And, um, you know, this past year, just Northwestern's in a brand new facility and it was a completely different dynamic because it, such a massive facility there were so many scouts and people in that in that room and it was just silent you know and you have all these college football players that are used to playing in front of 80 to 100,000 screaming fans and all of a sudden they're in an environment that is so uh sterile and quiet and and I think uh you know that's kind of one of my takeaways from last year is I want to do a better job of preparing them for what it's actually going to feel like at the pro day um, that, uh, that they're just not used to that feeling. And so I think they, they, they can overthink it and it can really affect their performance, which if you come out of a track background, you're, you're probably more used to preparing guys for that. But football players, unless they were track athletes, they, they really don't know what they're getting into. Yeah. Nobody shows up to scream and shout at a track meet. Right. Um, <laughs> Ronnie, thank you, Tommy. Ronnie, um, you want to go over sort of your evolution too as part of this this whole combine prep working with these pro or preparing these pro athletes and what you kind of went through and how you've grown it so i'm very new on the combine side um jelani's going to be one of my first guys to take uh, to take but it, I, I do have um quite a bit of experience with uh, more veteran guys um and so from bringing them in the door um, it's really just been about listening um, to where they're coming from, uh, using what assessments that I feel are necessary to get to that, uh, get to you know, meet their idea of a result, but also uh, my own interpretation of what that idea of a result is. Um, you know, because sometimes um, it's, it's not just with the NFL guys, but you know, sometimes athletes come in and they have this idea that they want to get, um, stronger, uh, but sometimes that'll affect their speed. And so you have to kind of play with it a little bit. Um, and how I've grown that, um, is really not been marketing. If any, it's, it's really just creating the relationships with the players. Um, and then getting their trust, you know, based on the results and based on uh, the level of service that I'm able to provide. Um, and then from there, I think the, the, the performance comes out because um, they're able to lean on me as a trusted resource um, throughout, throughout the, the 52 weeks of the year, right? Um, obviously, while they're in season, they're very busy, they're very wrapped up. And so the, the communication is, 
way lower. Um, but I, I definitely open myself up to, uh, to allow for that. Right. Cool. And I mean, it's interesting. You talk about like the result comes, uh, how many people think that like, and maybe Tommy, you can jump in first, but if there's anybody else here who does combine prep, please jump in. I mean, is, is, is there value in having this testing combine is game film stats, not enough talking to the athlete uh, Tommy, you want to jump in first and see where that all fits in. I know, you know, we don't want to uh, sour your business here, but at the same time, is the, is the combine worthwhile? Like is pro days and all this putting them on exhibition to do things that weren't really specifically part of the game? Right. Tommy? And then- yeah. I, I mean, I think it, it's the, it's the environment and the system that exists if you want to play in the NFL. And um, so I think we could argue that how, you know, how much is it a value compared to just watching, like you said, we have film of guys playing at a high level against high, you know, now if there's somebody who's a D3 player, I think that testing maybe becomes more important for them because you can sort of normalize them with players that maybe played at a higher level. But if somebody's played in the SEC or Big Ten and you can watch them play, you know, wouldn't you be able to, if you're a good scout, be able to look at what they did at the college level and extrapolate that out to the NFL and say, this, this player is going to be the real deal in college. Uh, yet uh, it's a, we see every year when we go into the combine process and at pro days, depending on how players do it, it really does move their status, uh, you know, and it can be several rounds. I mean, I, I had a, uh, you know, years ago, I, I trained Garrett Wolf, who was a running back from Northern Illinois, who uh, wound up being drafted in the third round by the Bears. And uh, his agent, and he played in the MAC conference, um, and he was a scat back. I think he was second in the nation in rushing, but he played against, you know, MAC competition for the most part. And the agent that represented him said if he, if he runs in the four fives, they thought he might be an undrafted free agent. But – you know, if, if we could get him into the four fours, they thought he might even be as high as a third round draft pick. And Garrett ran a four three eight at Northern Illinois Pro Day and got drafted in the third round. And so that process was really important to where he went into the NFL. But once once you get there, it's all about your performance. You know, but depending on what you ran at the combine or your pro day, like that's a label that you have. So if you, if you're in the NFL and you get cut, you're, you're still being shopped around and, you know, other like pro scout, you know, personnel are looking at you if you got cut and saying, well, he ran a four, three at his pro day. So let's take a chance on that guy where if he ran a, you know, a four, four or four, five, you know, depending on the position, like it may not, it just may not open that door. I think at the end of the day, um, you know, you got to be a great football player to have a career in the NFL. Um, you know, my, my brother played 11 years in the NFL as a fullback and never ran a great 40 and had an awesome career because he was a great football player, you know. But when it comes to opening the door, there's a lot of guys that, uh, that maybe never had a career that they could have had because they, they just couldn't perform at a pro day to get a door to open because they were a borderline guy. Um, so I, I think it's, I, I think it's important. I don't think it dictates whether they're going to be a great football player, but I think depending on how they do, it opens that door where they have a chance to show that, Hey, yeah, I can really play, you know, and we all know that like speed and movement is critical to being a great football player, uh, is running a great three cone time or, you know, the, just, you know, some of the things or you learn technique, is that critical, you know, it's, it's a sign of good athleticism, but some of it's a sign of good preparation too. Who was your poster boy for like, this guy was off the radar, came to the combine, blew it up and then had a successful career. Is there somebody you point to or like, this yeah. is the guy you know, who, well, I, I mean, at the combine, um, I don't, I don't know that I would have a poster boy at the combine. Uh, I mean, Justin Jackson, a couple years ago, uh, had an unbelievable combine, um, you know, for him, his tailback out of Northwestern, who everybody thought was really slow. And he ran a four five flat at the combine. And, you know, some scouts told me at Northwestern's pro day, they had him in the four fours and they thought he was a 
four six guy, but he was still an undrafted free agent. Didn't really didn't really matter. But he's doing great with the San Diego Chargers right now. Um, his speed, like I mean, it's kind of one of the things that is meaningful to me is like, you know, combine prep isn't about tricking somebody in how to have a great forty start. You know, the start's important, but it's really getting them faster, you know, and if, if we do a good job in combine prep and then we're able to transition that into maybe their mini camp prep and then they go to the NFL, they, they should actually be faster and it should make an, you know, make an impact and show up in games. And I feel like I see that when I see Justin playing for the Chargers and I see what he did at Northwestern, like he's a different guy, uh, you know, and, and so, but I had a guy the same year that I trained, uh, so this was three years ago, Joe Jones plays for the Denver Broncos and he just was nominated for a second pro bowl as a special teams guy. And he, he didn't even have an agent. Like nobody would pay for his training. He paid for his training with us out of his own pocket. Uh, he barely was a starter in college, just his last year, didn't have great film. And then at his pro day as a linebacker, he ran a four, four, five, 40 broad jumped almost 11 feet. And, you know, it didn't get him drafted, but it got him, you know, uh, you know, priority free agent, you know, undrafted free agent with the Cowboys and had a great mini camp, wound up getting cut anyway, bounced around. Uh, but I, you know, I feel like the label that when you read about him in any media, when he gets cut or picked up, he's not getting cut anymore. Like he's kind of a, established himself, but it's always like he was so athletic. He ran a four, four at his pro day. Like that label kind of follows him. Uh, with his career right now so but he was a good example somebody who paid for his training and now is thriving in the NFL uh, that's good to know that's good to hear because like one of the other questions I had was like if if people come to you and they got cash in hand and then you know this dude is not good enough to play in the NFL but he still wants to keep the combine dream alive yeah. you still train him uh, I'm gonna have an honest conversation with them and say look you're probably not going to make it. And um, at the end of the day, for me, like if you want to pursue your dream and you can be a positive part of our group, um, then I would allow him to train with us because who am I to say somebody can't pursue their dream? You know, and I played college football, you know, I was a, you know, I was a starting Mike linebacker at Northwestern in 1992. And I, I would never have, made it in the NFL my senior year I got medical anyway but you know if I had the chance I probably would have gone for it like what do, what do I have to lose I have a degree in engineering I'm gonna be fine like yeah, who knows you know like stranger things that happened and like I, I would rather put that to rest and know that I did my best and be like all right you know all my eggs aren't riding in that but if I get a chance to play like it would be awesome why not but but I think for me with our group I just I want to keep the quality of what we're doing high. And, and so I want to make sure that um, they're going to be positive, you know, contributor in that group that they can pay actually <laughs> as well. And, and just be upfront to say that there's no, no guarantee. And like the, you're, the odds of you making it, if you weren't a star in college, like why do you think you can play in the NFL? Like, you, you know, you, you do see that with players that maybe they didn't even start on their college team. And like, you, it, it would be very rare that you're actually going to even get a shot, even to get into a camp if you don't have film from your college career. Good point. I like that answer. Uh, Jean-Luca, you had a, a comment again about this whole concept of combine, combine dreams and people taking shots. What, what is your, your experience? Oh, we still got you muted there. Sorry. There, oh, you, go. Try, there you go. I'm good. You're good. I can hear you. What's up, guys? So I've been sending guys to the CFL for um, the last five years. Uh, I sent about half a dozen guys every year. The, I find the CFL combine is very difficult. Um, maybe you could attest to that. Um, like just last year, um, when they ran the 40, they ran it on like AstroTurf that was on cement instead of running it like on an um, actual field. Every year I hear of like, like my guys tell me like it's a disaster. Like when they test you for the vert, they like stretch you out. So like you're kind of like almost on your tippy toes. That's your reach. And then when you jump, like, so 
Um, hey, Canadians are so fucking righteous. That's why, right? <laughs> and oh, they have no standards around anything. Sorry, I had to say that. Zero standards. Like, it's so crazy. I've never heard, like, I've never heard so much ridiculousness happen at the CFL. Like, I think last year, they, it was, like, even, like, it was all hand uh, timed um, events. I'm like, there's no lasers. Like, nobody could give us lasers. <laughs> they don't have lasers in Canada, man. No, no, no. The, the, the snow lasers... gets in the way. The snowflakes get exactly. in the way. <laughs> exactly. Just icicle. <laughs> oh, but um, anyways, just to say, like, my point, the way I take care of my guys for the, uh, the CFL, um, I look at it on an aspect of, like, just getting guys right. Like, most of the guys finish their season. They're beat up. They're tight. Um, so just, like, doing a bunch of rehab, making sure that, uh, their their hip flexors are loose, opening up their stride. I feel that's what's going to give them the most advantage. Uh, I feel like a lot of the tests at the combine are not really in, like coaches don't even look at it. They don't even care if like you run a four or five, unless like you're really like um, out of the the norm. Like you're going to run like a four three, then it'll be like th- they'll look at you, but they're not expecting that. They know already if your CFL potential or not. So they're just looking at the fact of, um, did you put in work? Did you upkeep by your conditioning? Uh, are you still strong? Um, and, and that kind of stuff. So I look at it. I hate using this word. Like, I got to find another way to say this, but just keeping the guys uber healthy. And, and that's the way I approach things. Uh, good point. Good point. And we're going to talk a bit about the training and what you focus on. I'll get people like Ryan Banta to talk about like his experience and what he sees from a, just a training point of view, because Tommy and even uh, Ronnie kind of mentioned it about, we want to get people just better, but how much do you, like, if we look at a proportion of like, do we prepare them for football versus we prepare them for the test? Does somebody want to jump in and talk about that? Like, is there like, well, 40% of our emphasis is on really just spending time on getting those tests done. And then the other 60% is like, let's do a general good training program to make sure that once they, you know, get to a training camp, they're, they're fit and they're ready to go. Because I yeah. think some people shift that. Can, yeah. can right. I just talk quickly? Um, okay. Yep. There's a, so there's a study by David Hedlund. It's a performance of future elite players at the NFL league scouting combine. And you can look like it puts every position based off future success. So there's none pro bowlers and then all pro. And there's some like weird tests. For example, the shuttle with running backs is inversely correlated to, to future success. But the thing you see is that everybody's within that bandwidth. So like there's only a difference between three hundredths of a second. So I, to, to me, I think what everybody said is right on. Like they're looking to see if you fit in the bandwidth of players and then your film jumps off. But that, that study is really interesting if like that, that meant a lot to me. We've sent it to our coaches and stuff. Yeah, that's a good point. Like you're not going like this test is going to ultimately determine the fate of your career. But it, if, you're, if you're out of that bandwidth, like you said, you're like, okay, let's look at the next guy. So yeah, that, that's a good point. You just want to be in the ballpark. Um, Ryan, uh, what are you seeing when you see people who are track athletes that also play football and what are the differences and maybe just the football specific people and the guys who have some diversification and how they've prepared, um, maybe even run, you know, in hundred meters, 200, whatever long jump. And then they go to the combine. Would you say they're better prepared? I would say that when we're looking at absolute speed and testing, anybody who's a track and field athlete is going to have much more body control amongst those tests and understands how to project themselves ballistically a hell of a lot better, even big guys, even, you know, due to our throwers or things like that. There's a guy right now who uh, went to our high school, Colin Saunders, who plays for the Kansas City Chiefs. He's a defensive tackle, and uh, he played one double-A ball, and, we, you know, he was a really fast guy at 320 pounds. So, obviously, he's not going to help us in, you know, the sprints. He'll win us a darned uh, throwers four by one every time. But the reality is that skill set carried over for him as a big man to project himself ballistically, you know, body control. Uh, obviously, he's one of the best throwers we ever had in school history. He could throw over 60 feet for those who are on the imperial scale uh, here in the States. But um, a really, really incredible athlete. 
Same thing for another guy that we had, uh, Lee Ward, who was not a barn burner track and field guy, but he was really good and really fast for a dude who was 250 pounds. And uh, he ended up setting the All-American uh, combine record for the Army thing what they do in their juniors in the bench press. Now, I did end up getting him a little too big to be a really, really good 100-meter guy. He got a little bit slower, actually, as high school went on, but that's because he went from 200 pounds to 250. Um, allowed him to play at Stanford and be a captain there, not necessarily to be a barn burner on your track team. But the skill set that they need for football is ultimately going to be enhanced no matter what, you know, all the skill in the world, all the foot mechanics in the world, if you can get to point A to point B faster than the other guy at your position. So a 320 pound man, you know, oftentimes isn't going against the wide receiver. So again, skill on skill, that guy's going to beat that offensive lineman more often than not if he's a defensive tackle. So it, what I like to see, and one of the things that I've seen Tony Holler do a lot of is promote that idea of how many of these guys that are having success at the Division One level, at the pro level, are also track and field athletes. If you look at Christian McCaffrey and uh, Ezekiel Elliott, both of those guys were very good high school track and field athletes, and they're the two best running backs in the league. You know, there's there's some commonalities there. So those people who say, I'm just going to, you know, spend time lifting and doing curls for the girls, you know, is probably not doing what they need to do. The other thing I would say, though, is for a lot of guys like Tommy – we want to get these guys at top end speed a lot and not just work on acceleration because they practice a lot um, accelerating all the time at their position with their fingers in the ground at the three point position, the four point position, the two point position. They practice acceleration a lot, but what they don't practice a lot is running at full speed. And you see it all the time in the combine. These guys just are all discombobulated. I'm like, holy cow, if I just had that guy for two or three months, I could clean him up. You know, and again, the test we know is only for kind of giving you that that ceiling of, OK, they're in the ballpark. We we are in the range of the skills that these guys need raw to be able to perform at the National Football League level or in Canadian football. We know they're within the window, but we also if you want to move up the ladder, if this guy's not a true blue uh, first round or maybe he's a second round, third round. Well, you want them to hit those tests that maybe they can move up and down in between them, you know. So I find there's a lot of value in it, um, but I think one of the things we make mistakes with to sum up is that we don't give enough importance to the top end speed at max velocity, even for the biggest guys on the field. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Tommy, throw back at you. Uh, it's typically about two months of preparation, would you say? And then how do you divide that up? Like how many times per week? What is your emphasis during that two month period? Is it mostly speed? How much on strength? How much on other qualities? How much on jumping? If you could kind of give us a kind of a quick rundown of how you take that two months, divide it up and say, I need to see you this many times. Yeah. Um, and this is what we're going to work on throughout each week. Yeah. Um, we, well, we typically have, you know, it depends on if somebody's going to the combine, they're probably going to be playing in the senior bowl or the East West game at least. So if somebody's going to the combine, and they played in a bowl game like New Year's Day, you, you really only have six weeks total because you have maybe seven weeks to the combine once they get to the facility, and then they're, you're going to lose a week in their all-star game. So it's such a short time frame. And I really agree with what Ryan was saying about the importance of you know, top speed. You know, some of these guys don't have that kind of background in their training. They run really poorly in that phase of sprinting. Um, but it's also like how much can you bite off if you only have six weeks? Um, yeah, how much time can you spend in maximum velocity training to begin with, which, you know, it's, you know, frankly terrifying with a lot of these guys because they just have never sprinted past 20 yards. So you, you know, you just, the, the fear of a, a hamstring injury, which ruins the whole thing. You know, I, I always feel like the more time I spend in max velocity, uh, the more I'm exposing myself to risk as well, especially with a bigger player who's not familiar with running those distances. Um, so, but in that eight week period, I usually look at it as kind of two phases for me. And that first phase, um, you know, is really where we're, we're trying to hammer as much as we can on uh, mechanics, you know, both just overall like speed development, like what we would do with any athlete, um, you know, but then the specifics of a 40 setup, 
the specifics of how to run a three cone and pro shuttle and, you know, even, you know, working on broad jump, just really trying to get the mechanics or skill acquisition down. And also, you know, they're coming off the season. So you want them to, you know, get any uh, nicks or, you know, sore areas to, to alleviate from what they've been through in the season, but also, um, you know, can we regain some of their power that they may have lost through the season in that first month? You know, if we're going to spend some time on regaining some level of strength development, you know, we would only do that in the first three or four weeks. And then that second month, I, I shift the emphasis in terms of weight room work to, you know, all like speed of movement, lighter weight, you know, I don't want to load them up. I really want to emphasize what we're doing on the field and, and make sure that they're fresh for that. And even having it more of a, you know, lifting program that would, uh, you know, tend to increase their power output rate of force development and not take away from what we're doing on the field. Cause the combines attract me, you know, it's, it's not a power lifting me. Um, you know, they don't, they don't have to, other than the bench rep, you know, it's all about speed and power and, you, you know, the bench isn't that important for most guys anyway. So it's really like anything that we do in the weight room really needs to lead to helping them to perform well. Um, and, and, and so that's kind of how we structure it. Um, you know, we don't spend, uh, I, I think, you know, a lot of places, you know, and it's been more and more over the last 10 years where, you know, agents and players want to know, um, you know, who's doing your position work? What are we doing for position training? It's like the first thing they ask. And, and I don't understand it. So I'm like, if you don't run fast, nobody cares, you know, about you hitting a bag. And like, why would, why would I watch an offensive lineman shuffle his feet and jam a bag when I can watch how he played, you know, on TV and I could see him playing against a guy that we know is a legit first round pick. Like I, I, I just, I think, there's this emphasis on the amenities of combine prep that just costs a lot. Like I can't afford to hire an NFL, you know, skill coach necessarily, or if I do, it's just going to bump your cost up. Like the, I feel like there's a lack of really assessment in like combine prep of what really matters, you know, cause if you did like a, uh, you know, needs analysis of what's actually going to maybe open a door and there is that bandwidth, you know, but, but if you're dealing with guys that are like undrafted guys, that bandwidth means they get a chance or they don't get a chance. And so like, we want to chase the upper end of that bandwidth. Like we don't want to be average. Like if you're average and you aren't already highly thought of, you just may not even get a chance. So you have to be above average and everything. And that's always like the goal that I have is like, I want to create, you know, in partnership with a player, some above average results, you know, really that open those doors for them and give them a chance to like, you know, pursue that dream. Uh, that was some interesting points there on the position coach stuff. And like, that's, that's the football focus, right? Like uh, sports specific, sports specific, but you're right. If, if they don't spend time at this point and getting on the radar, then it doesn't matter. And then they go from, you know, the, you know, I feel like, okay, you get to your pro day or combine end of February pro day, first week of March, you have another like six to eight weeks to get ready for mini camp, you know? And, and, and to me, like, you know, with the guys that we've trained for the combine, then we shift into that mini camp prep, you know, and it's a relief to not have to run the, you know, another stupid three cone pro shuttle ever again, you know, or we don't have to get in a 40 stance again. And now it's, really fun but hopefully like those the the speed development acceleration improvement top speed we can still use that you know and then start to do things more positionally and and you have plenty of time at that point to get them ready for mini camp um, yeah I, I don't think it's an issue good points good points and i know the things that were talked about like Gianluca, ronnie tommy um health like getting people healthy i want rob to jump in because again rob i want you to kind of explain what you saw from the medical point of view, the evaluations, how important that is, and then kind of work back. Like if you have to get somebody ready, just even to show well so that they can do the tests and then even show well at the medical exam, if you could go through that, that that'd be pretty interesting for people, Rob. Oh, single agent. That. You're good. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I mean, I have one particular agent that'll, call me with regards to, I don't do combine training, but prepare somebody 
so they can train for combine training if they're injured or if they get injured during training. That's one factor of it. The other factor of the combine is you go through these medical evaluations. There are some conditions where the natural history of progression is not good. And so you have to determine, you know, what the expectancy of the athlete with that medical condition is going to provide for you with regards to draft position and money paid. And that, and that's what I think happens with the medical. I mean, you know, is this particular individual worth drafting in this round and be given that money based on the natural history of their injury? I think, I think, you know, it's not that simple, but in a way it is that simple. Um, Cause just some things, you know, don't pan out well over time. And that, and that's all, that's all uh, combines, all sport combines. So, I mean, it's like the Reader's Digest answer, I guess. But, um, and then you have to just watch out for people that, you know, as mentioned before, I agree with everything that's been said in regards to my, my limited experiences with combine training. But um, when you want to give somebody the benefit of progressing, making them better and better, and you use products, you have to be careful with these products because some of these products, like I had one kid that um, started using a very stiff insole to get an elastic response on the ground. And when he didn't use the insole, he wound up with an Achilles tendonitis. And that was a big concern, how he was going to be able to perform at the combine with this Achilles tendonitis. So if you never use the insoles, chances are, you know, that wouldn't have happened. So be careful with the products you utilize too with your athletes. They may give you an advantage for some point in time, but you may get some uh, results you didn't expect at other times. So I don't think there's any substitute for good training. Good training. I don't. If somebody uh, has a history, like say somebody had a pretty significant injury the previous year, um, does going through and watching them do the combine tests maybe give people some security around drafting that person saying, okay, they had this ACL or this Achilles rupture, but they look pretty good when I see them run. And obviously their season was probably okay, but do you think there's some value in having people go through, through the test to actually prove people wrong or, or to instill some confidence in their selection, given the injury history? You know, I think in those cases, you know, Alvaro Mill will, will say the biggest test is can they play? And we, and we never talk about it, right? And Tommy talked about that before. I mean, the years he used to work the off-seasons with the Giants, George Young would say, the GM for the Giants would say that the combine can only hurt a player because he's going to base his draft pick on essentially game film and their performance. And he preferred players, as Tommy stated before, at larger conferences because they played against the best competition. And thus, you know, that was his opinion, that the combine can only hurt a player unless you had this outlier that had an unbelievable time or jump performance or whatever that was unexpected. So, you know, when someone's injured and you're going to take a risk on them, like if you look at Achilles tendons, even at the pro level, their first year back, their first season back, and they're already in the league for clarity. Their first season back is subpar usually compared to their prior seasons. It's not till their second season where they get to where they were or not improve. And obviously the, the older the athlete, the more difficult that is. So, There's a number of factors, but if you're talking about the combine or a particular injury in a player that's a star at the college level, I think you're going to bank on their game film and the risk that depending upon the injury and the natural history of that injury, whether it's debilitating or you'll recover 100%, that's what's going to determine if that player gets drafted, if it's that bad an injury. Yeah, there was an interesting thing that was said. One of your surgeon friends, orthopedic surgeon friends, we were talking to him and you said, well, yeah, you want to pick players from the big conferences and the big schools because they played against the top competition. But he also said that there's one team in particular, one college where all the guys had the most sort of orthopedic issues because of that. You know, is that a, is that a fine balance as well? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think if you... I'm not doubting what he says because he's in it, yeah. right? But I don't think if you enroll at the university of whatever, you're going to have high injury rates. I mean, I think that's a, 
that's a factor of what particularly happened that season or over a couple of seasons. Longevity, I just can't see it that if you enroll at a particular university, you're going to guarantee to have a high injury rate. It doesn't make sense to me. That said, I understand what he's saying, and I know who it is, and he keeps his comments based on facts. But, um, you know, I think injuries happen because of poor preparation, um, you know, poor conditions, and, and maybe just not lucky, you know. Yeah. We, have, we have a strength coach that works with us that worked in the NFL for a long time. And he said that all of the athletes he scanned from a certain university, which I would guess is the exact same one, came in with extreme mobility deficits in comparison. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, that, that seems to be common knowledge around a lot of the people involved. So um, certainly there's probably some extra thought going into selecting so, people. So, yeah. so, so is that a factor of the university? Is that a factor of poor training? That, you know, that's my point, you know? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Um, just throwing it out here to everybody, like, do you find that when you work with some of these players, are you, like, I think Tommy talked about, but you're just kind of correcting things too. Like, if they're coming from a program where maybe the quality control wasn't as good, are you now going, okay, we're going to teach you how to run. We're going to teach you how to cut. We're going to teach you how to lift properly. Like, is that very common? Uh, Jean-Luc, you have your hand raised, so let's, let's jump in with you first. But this sort of correct, I mean, I hate the word corrective exercise, but, but you're correcting things that may have not been addressed earlier. John. Well, yeah, so, yeah, so, so I was thinking about, like, how this discussion all started up, right? And what you like you we initiated this discussion because of what's the business behind the combine prep and we we kind of got to realize that the business behind this is that guys are coming to see outside coaches because they feel that their university cannot prepare them for what's coming up like essentially that's what it is because if not they would stay at their university and the other thing too is that the reason why this happens is because like this is in Canada and in the States is that w while they're in university, they cannot um, seek outside help, whether it's nutritionally, whether it's therapeutic, whether it's, uh, whether it's training. So that's the business we're in. Um, and that being said is that that's exactly what we're doing is we're picking up these guys and we got to just get them right for uh for what's coming up because the university hasn't been able to to do that and i think uh one of the things that we need to look at as well as when we're preparing these guys uh, i feel like uh i made this mistake like early on in my career and i like i i had to like live it to understand it and then make an adjustment is that we have to stop looking at it on like a short-term basis in the sense of like all right, we got like 12 weeks or eight weeks, whatever it is, get you ready for a uh, combine. And then you have like six weeks to camp instead of doing like always like little jumps. Cause like what, what's happening is guys are like, okay, I got to peak for camp in university. Then the seasons and then I got to peak for combine cause that's coming up. Then I got to peak for mini camp cause that's what's coming up. Just look at it on a long term perspective of like guys got to fix their issues before anything like there's like there's a there's a saying you can't shoot a cannon out of a canoe right so like guys just have to get right on all bases and that's the that's the real business that we're in yeah and, and i i don't necessarily want to shit on universities uh I'll, I'll just phone up Nikki Kirk and do that on my private time but um tommy like you have a good relationship with northwestern and how do you kind of work that you know, like I'm this external person, I can help, you know, you guys are doing a good job, you know, how do you work that relationship? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, I think, number one is, you know, having mutual respect and, um, you know, really not just a year round relationship with those guys and what they're doing, uh, just to build that rapport and, and trust. And then um, really, like they, I think with, with Northwestern staff, they recognize that their experience and expert, you know, their, as well as just their time, like, isn't, 
it's not conducive to trying to prepare their players for the pro day. That's not what they're paid to do. Um, and so they, they have seen just because I've been there for so long, I've been working with, you know, players, not just out of Northwestern, but you know, a lot of Northwestern guys over the last 18 to 20 years that they, they, they trust me. I'm not a threat to them. Um, I, I seek any way that I can to help them just with what they're doing with their speed development work with their, you know, off season type stuff. And, um, uh, you know, and then going into it, the, you know, the doors open to the point where, uh, you know, they want their players to train with me for the combine and the, in the pro day. And, and I'm able to really have really rare access to Northwestern's facilities. And, you know, we, I'll meet with, uh, you know, their director of football performance, um, you know, several times going into the prep phase. So I know the players that I'm training, uh, just kind of what issues that they've had throughout their college career, you know, what were some of the modifications that they did as a strength staff uh, with the players, um, maybe exercises or things that they avoided, uh, you know, maybe special kind of, uh, you know, just prep, warm up, additional, maybe corrective work that players did. And so, um, you know, really having a, a open communication, it's been really important with them and, and having just a trusting relationship, you know, and there's no magic, you know, to that. It's just, you know, over time. And I think being respectful and, and realizing that, you know, their job is really hard. And I respect that because I used to be in that world a long time ago. And, and, so it's easy to like, you know, when I have a very small number of guys, I can do a much more detailed job. If, if you know, I was in a situation as an assistant at Northwestern, when we had two full-time strength coaches with the entire team and we had other teams as well. That was a lot harder to do the kind of detail that I can do now. And so I, I just think there's uh, understanding there and um, they're, they're good at different things. And, and so, um, but I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, I, I think because um, the next thing I want to jump into is kind of the, the, again, let's talk about the business side. Like you have this relationship, you'll get referrals from the university because of that relationship. What are some of the other ways? Rob, you want to jump in quickly? Yeah, I just, I just want to caution people with correction and asymmetries and stuff. Um, not that it's wrong or incorrect, but I would bet that everyone or the majority of the people on the Zoom pop are either right-handed or left-handed. So you're, asymmet you're asymmetrical to begin with. And when you look at quarterbacks or pitchers in baseball, or et cetera, every time they perform on the field of play, they are reinforcing that asymmetry, right? If you're a right-handed hitter and you go to batting practice, you're reinforcing that asymmetry. And that asymmetry is what is making you successful. So my point is, is there are some, that's the art, right? What do we correct and what, we, what don't we correct? But don't just jump out at something because someone's asymmetry, has an asymmetry that by correcting it, they're going to be better because you may get a result you don't desire. Usain Bolt has got one leg shorter than the other. He's got scoliosis. He's got a number of factors. He's the fastest man in the world for the period of time that he was competing. So if you correct that a lot of things or try to do things with Hussein Bolt, you might have affected his performance. So I'm not saying don't correct, don't look at asymmetry, but just be careful on what you select to do because you may not get the result you desire. Yeah, I had an interesting conversation about people having more right side low back pain and then he was going on about, well, how do we drive? Which foot do we use? Right? Like you're using one foot all the time, you know, anyways. Uh, thanks Rob. Um, but the business side, like let's start with, Tom. we'll go, we'll start with Tommy and then we'll go to Ronnie. Cause I know Ronnie has some good interactions with agents and, you know, especially like nutrition staff at a certain team. Anyways, uh, <laughs> Tommy, um, agents, like how do you, if I'm like, I want to get into this business and I want to, you know, do make a name for myself as the combine guru, which is a, a, an awesome word. Um, what do I do? Who do I contact? Who do, do I contact the university? Do I contact players? Do I, you know, start an Instagram or, you know, what are, what are some things that you would recommend to people? Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't know that the way that I 
I got into it would 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 work necessarily, but I, I think um, I, I think you have to identify who the agents are that are you know maybe local to where you are. You know, you I think you kind of look at uh, you got to look at where's low hanging fruit. You know, so it might be your local. It might be that you know, on the, uh, if there's somebody, you know, you got to kind of look at, I think your network of people, you know, first, just have a conversation, especially if you're new to it. Uh, you haven't done it before. It's going to be harder to like get somebody to trust you. So I think you have to kind of maybe go through people who you might already have in your network. And the same thing when it comes to, you know, athletes, I think there's, there's two ways to go about recruiting and one is going through, well, maybe three, you know, you go through agents, you go through relationships with uh, strength staff, sports performance staffs at universities, and then you go through to the players themselves. And so I think in all of those worlds, you have to identify maybe who's in your network, uh, you know, where's a relationship that you could leverage uh, to be able to get a chance, um, you know, and, and like for me, it, it started out with like, I just had the relationship with the university but then through that, I quickly, you know, worked with players who had agents and then those agents saw, uh, you know, working with me firsthand, they saw results. They either liked, hopefully, or they didn't like the experience, but if they liked it now, oh, I signed a player from University of Illinois or, you know, Nebraska or USC or other places. And so like pretty quickly, like I was able to train, you know, players from all over and for yeah, I mean, I just think for a while with that business side, like it used to be, you know, from 2000 to 2000, you know, I don't know, 2010, 2012, I felt like in that era, it was about the agent relationship. And I had an agent who would pay me a set fee and he'd, everybody he signed, he would send to me to train. And, and then as like Instagram, social media, the maybe, you know, NFL network now being in existence and then showing the combine and combine training to become a big business, players now know, oh, I want to go train at, you know, like the big one is Exos, you know, it's like, oh, we want to train at Exos. And, um, and so it used to be, I think, more driven, at least in my experience, by the agent, where now I think it's driven more by the player. And that's to me harder, you know, cause it's, it, I think it's harder to build those relationships with 21 year olds all over the country, you know, as opposed to like agents. So I, I, and I don't think I have the solution on that. Like I, I, I've relied more on just referrals and relationships than actually marketing and recruiting. And, and I think I, depending on how big I want that part of my business to be, I, I think I have to make a real shift and in investment in recruiting at the player level. Yeah. You just got to start a TikTok account. Um, thanks, Tommy. Think <laughs> <laughs> Ronnie, Ronnie, agents, players, wheeling, dealing. How do you do it? Oh, so get you to unmute there, Ronnie. Sorry. There you go. Oh, there. there you go. Okay, agents. Um, I am probably O for twenty on, <laughs> on on getting any positive traction with agents. I've gotten through to phone calls and had great conversations for a follow up meeting and for them to come to my facility, uh, but the follow up has never happened. Um, I've had two agents recently um, reach out to me to send players. Uh, one of them. Um, he did follow up, which was nice, and, but ended up saying, hey, well, we're going to go with another guy uh, who has more um, DB coaching experience. And I was like, okay, well, <laughs> go for Tell it. Tommy's shaking his head. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, which is funny. That came up earlier. <laughs> um, but honest, and you know, one, of, uh, one of my NFL players um, who is currently on the field um, – he actually, you know, again, he's, he's been one of my, my biggest culprits for, for success and giving you referrals. Um, again, so it all comes down kind of like Tommy said, it's, it's relationships, it's results. And if, if you can do that with the player, I think it's a direct, um, because they're the one that's going to give the, the best testimonial. 
right? The agents are obligated and they're motivated by the contract. And sometimes when you're motivated by um, kind of extrinsic things like that, um, that are going to benefit not just the player monetarily, but the agent monetarily, well, things get, mm, priorities get shifted. And so, you know, for me, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a small business budget. You know, I don't, I don't have the ability to hire a bunch of recruits and send them out to my agents, you know, or send it out to agents to bring them back. Uh, and it's also not my personality. You know, I, I want to just show up and do my job. Uh, I want to have fun doing my job. And I think that uh, if I'm able to maintain that in my office, then the direct benefit is to the athlete. Yeah, good point. You guys are both good dudes too. So I know you connect well with the athletes. Um, one thing I want to finish on was just like pricing fees. How do you guys do it? Because obviously if you got some guys who are going to be big timers, you know, maybe cost isn't an issue. You have some people on sort of the, the, the fringes, like, is it a one-time fee, Tommy? Like this is your combine prep. You pay this, you pay up front and we don't talk about it again. Is it per week? Is it per, you know, let's talk a little bit about, you don't have to give us hard numbers, but at the same time, how do you structure that so that it's successful for you, but also affordable and works for everybody? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's timely cause I'm talking to players and agents now about that. And, and, uh, you know, for, for me, it's like, I think it's gotta be, it's gotta be upfront when dealing with agents. I mean, I've over the years, I've been stiffed, you know, you know, probably tens of thousands of dollars uh, over the years cumulatively. And, and I just think, you know, there are some agents that are really awesome, you know, high integrity people who are honest and, you know, uh, even agents that you might be surprised by a TV persona who uh, actually like are super professional when it comes to hiring people to work with their athletes. Um, but I think you got to get payment up front because I think we can be put in some false pretense that we can guarantee an outcome or result, you know, and the reality, you know, and I talk to agents all the time and like, do you have some sort of sliding scale? This guy's not a combine invite. I'm like, I treat everybody the same, you know, and I, I don't think any player deserves more of me than any other player. If they come in, my commitment is I'm going to, do my best with my team for every player and the cost is going to be the same and the cost is the cost. And, and I just try to be real firm with that and say, I'm not the cheapest. I'm definitely not the most expensive, but I have to price it based on, you know, I may have four or five guys like, and, and I can't, I'm not going to do it at a loss. I'm not going to take two months out of my business, which completely takes my eye off the ball of everything else that I'm trying to do in my company because it's so time consuming. And I spend it on these, these guys, like it's gotta be worth it in the end, you know, and, and I have to stand by, you know, it's not a, to me, it's not a cost, you know, it's not a commodity. It's not like you can just go and like, well, we could just hire somebody else. Like, yeah, you could hire somebody else, but if, if they don't have some sort of a track record of experience of getting results at the end of the day, like if they don't perform well, it doesn't matter if you spent a thousand or $2,000 more at this place or that place. All that really matters is like, if you made it, it's not going to matter. You know, if, if you got the outcome that mo improved your status, that a thousand that, you know, one or two grand that they were negotiating on isn't really going to matter, you know? Um, so I, but sometimes when players have to pay, I may with, if a, if a player is paying for their own training, I'll tend to do a, a week to week at the start of the week, you know, and then I just try to make sure that we have a credit card or something like that on file, just so it's not an issue. Uh, Cause if you wind up chasing stuff after the fact, you're, you're going to lose out in my experience. Yeah. Very, very, very solid advice there. Um, Ronnie, you kind of the same with that stuff. Uh, for sure. Yeah, everything is um, – am I unmute? Okay. No, you're good. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. Uh, I take credit card up front. <laughs> um, you know, and, and again, I, I, just like Tommy, I, I treat everyone the same. Um, 
you know, this is a business transaction. I have to perform a job and I have to ultimately get to a certain result. Um, you know, my, my services, uh, I, I do cover nutrition. I, I do cover some other things. And so I kind of wrap it in. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. And, um, so that's how I do it. But, um, I'll be, I'll be looking to make some, some small changes in the, in the future, especially as I get uh, more players coming in this off season. Um, and I would imagine as, as I get more, uh, of the combine prep guys, but still the, the, the business practice, the business model has to remain, um, transparent, right? You're getting, you're getting this product, this service, and I'm going to get you to this result based on your individual needs. Um, not based on a, uh, a mass marketed type of model that, um, these other brands like Exos, uh, Michael Johnson, that those type of guys, they, they have their own formulas and it works. Um, but that's not how I run my system. Right. And so, yeah. Awesome. Uh, Robert, Rob, Robert, I see Robert, Rob, do you have any like final thoughts on just the business side of these things? And again, you know, would you say that having this sort of approach where like, okay, this is the cost you pay up front, just having it a professional approach is going to pay dividends in the long run rather than sort of like, well, if you make, if you get drafted, then we'll talk about money later. No, I agree with what's been said because you'll get left hanging most of the time. The other thing I, I would, uh, bend the rules on a little bit. Now those situations, as mentioned earlier, if a player doesn't have an agent and they're paying out of pocket, then I'd make sure I had their credit card, but I would work a deal that you're charging periodically. So not to drain them in a one shot charge. Right. And so, you know, you can be flexible in that means, but you know, I wouldn't do anything for free and I wouldn't do anything without it being up front with regards to an agent or you know someone that can afford the fee of your services because as stated before, and if I, I have experienced as well, you'll get stiffed uh, too many times and once is too many times. So. And the great thing about putting a fee forward, you're like, this is how much it is. Like it's a filter to some degree. It filters out the people that you just don't want to be involved with anyways. Right. And I, I think, yeah, just, just yeah. conduct yourself with that way. And, and, if you're, you know, wishing to, you know, oh, well, maybe they'll pay me. Like, yeah, you're right. You're going to get burned. So. Well, you're, entitled, you're entitled to get paid for your services. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't have anybody ever feel like they would demean themselves in regards to the quality of their services. Charge what you think you're worth and make sure you get paid. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, I just want to thank everybody for jumping on. Like, this is a lot of people to get a couple of days before Christmas. I do want to say Tommy wins the award for the best backdrop. He's got the sunlight on the books. You know, he's got that very mentory looking 60 minutes, whatever thing going on. So that's awesome. Thank um, you, Jerry. I worked yeah. hard on that. <laughs> awesome and i do commend the people who are doing it from their car too because like i don't know how you do that man so anyways uh everybody want to wish you a merry christmas and we'll be in touch and again thank you for your time today and again just have a good week coming up uh with family and friends take care Bye guys. Thanks. thanks a lot i'll post this too for everybody thanks thank you derek take care <clears throat>